Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Lion Knights. Last time we met Gus and Doug, and with them learned where they were, what had happened to them, and what they now were. Now, these are their continued adventures and the adventures of their companions. This is Huspan. This looks like a good port, remarked Captain Fletcher. He stood on the deck of the Bethos as it sailed into the harbor of Huspan at the mouth of the river Hus. It was middle morning and the weather was breezy and clear, clear at least except for the bank of storm just visible on the horizon. But that was the edge storm, the boundary of chaos, and never moved. Or if it did, it was time for everyone and everything in the world lit of Varsus to find another realm. Huspan showed whitewashed buildings with golden brown tiles on the roofs and a harbor full of craft of many sizes. The docks and quays bustled, though the people were hardly more than brightly colored specks at this distance. It welcomes little fishes in with gently smiling jaws, replied Doug Chiang. Very prosperous, very free, too, and tolerant, as long as you don't get in the way of the prosperity. Easy in that way for an American to get used to. But you didn't like the place, Fletcher said. You could see now that many of the folk on the docks were staring at the Bethos. Doug shrugged and waved at Huspan with his right arm, the one with the new hand. It's a city, foreign and crowded, full of people and customs to trip over. Out roughing it, you might wonder how hungry a body could get or what things might live in the undergrowth, or of course about bandits. He looked at the new hand and flexed it. But I felt more out of place here than in the wilderness, he glanced at Fletcher. Your folk must feel the same. Indeed. Neither were built for the cities of men. To look in the face, Fletcher was an old man with white hair and beard, but below the waist he was a dumb horse. Between he wore a red-brown military jacket. His hat was a Stetson, a cowboy hat, in dusty blue. Fletcher stood seven feet tall, but Doug Chiang overmatched him by three inches. Unlike Fletcher, Doug was humanoid, in a feline way. His ears were large, pointed, and mobile. He had a muzzle, no longer than a human nose, but a muzzle nonetheless, and luxurious cat whiskers that reached as wide as his shoulders. His good hand was clawed with additional spurs on the knuckles, and behind waved a leonine tail, aiding his balance on the gently rolling deck. But not only feline. He wore pants and boots and an open vest, showing skin on arms and chest that was thickly scaled in rectangular knobs like crocodile hide, though the color was still a golden tan, the color of a young Asian man much in the sun, as he had once been. So I feel no pang, Doug went on, at leaving Huspan behind forever. He glanced at Fletcher again though I suppose I should be careful now about words like forever. A lean, middle-aged Palomino centaur clattered up and saluted the two captains. He smiled and presented Doug with a book, a sheaf of papers hot glued down the spine. The cover read, The Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis. There you are, sir, the Palomino said. No illustrations, I'm afraid, but the complete text. Thank you, Lieutenant, said Doug, smiling back. He riffled through the book, looking for something at the back. May I ask, sir, why you wanted that particular book? Lieutenant Sanders asked. Behind him came another cat man who said, Yeah, I'm curious too. Doug ignored them, paused at a page, said ah to himself, and read for a little. Men are supposed to be stoic. Chinese are supposed to be reserved. Soldiers are supposed to be disciplined. Doug was all three, but Fletcher was a careful observer and saw Doug's eyes change. They were a human golden brown, but slit pupiled. The feline slits widened at something fascinating, and a human hint of moisture barely started to gleam. Doug blinked, 
quietly took a deep breath and said, Right, softly to himself. He turned to the other cat man. I don't quite know why, he said. It haunted me. But I still relish my privacy, even from you, Zhijie, brother, friend. So I'm just going to mull it over in private. In short, tell you later. He looked at the lieutenant. Sorry, Mr. Sanders, you too, but thank you for getting it printed. I was surprised you made room for it in a ship's library, said the other cat man, even online. This was Gus. He was shorter and stockier than Doug, a mere inch over seven feet, blue-eyed and with sandy brown hair. Like Doug, he spoke in a Midwestern American accent, his voice a husky tenor, Doug's a smooth bass. Oh, we've got quite an extensive fantasy library, sir, Sanders assured him. You have to sift carefully, of course, but when you're exploring the out zones, it's useful to have a record of rumors that may have filtered back to the Mond Miner through the Dreaming or whatever. But no real Narnia, said Gus, a bit sadly. Not that we know of, sir, Sanders said to the younger man. It'd be gone by now anyway, said Doug, putting a sympathetic arm on Gus's shoulder. All gone further up and further in, remember? Yeah, but there'd still be the wood between the worlds. Well, he turned to Fletcher. Captain Phil, I've advised Captain Coudray that those little rowboats with the blue noses are the local customs officials. They're very uh, diligent, rapacious, Doug translated. And they have guards with crossbows, plus their friends back on shore. Sounds like a time to be pleasantly but firmly diplomatic, said Fletcher. Yes, sir. Kudre asked everyone to start spreading that word, starting with the captains. Thank you, Gus. Duly noted. Gus nodded and departed with Doug. Sanders watched them out of earshot, gave them some more distance, since their ears were very keen, then said, Captain Phil, in an offended tone. Fletcher grinned at his aide-de-camp. It's worse. You know how informal Americans are. I was calling them Captain Chiang and Captain Weisskopf, since that's how they style themselves. But they asked me to call them Doug and Gus. So I told them to call me Philip, but they seemed uncomfortable with that. Captain Phil seems their idea of a compromise. Sanders shifted on his hooves and looked uncomfortable himself. In relaxed moments, Fletcher sometimes called him Liam, but Sanders never addressed his commander as anything less than sir. Well, sir, he said, informal they may be, but I suppose they want to show respect. After all, I'm old enough to be their grandfather, Fletcher smiled. I was going to say that you've given them a lot of help. So they want to include your rank to acknowledge that, even if they call themselves captains, too. Fletcher nodded. We're in a very captain-rich environment at the moment, and here they come. Working her way across the deck toward them was Captain Kudre, the actual skipper of the Bethos. Closely following was Captain Dean of the Standard Cavalry, in charge of the land-based side of the expedition. They were normal humans. She, short and slim, composed and professional. He, tall and athletic, quite suitable for a professional adventurer. But the eye of an outside of observer would have been drawn to the remaining three captains. Captain Elaine of the dedicated cavalry, a dapple gray with steel gray hair and beard and a dark, handsome, aquiline face, like Fletcher leading a class of trainees, and Gus and Doug, the captains of the Rauerhof, the lion host. Gentlemen, said Coudray to the beast men, if you would, please arrange yourselves around Captain Dean and myself and try to look big and weird and scary. Loom, if you like. It never hurts to have an edge. But don't scowl. Captain Fletcher, I'll do the introducing, but when we get to the subject of the Rauerhof, please take over. Uh, that is, she added, after Captains Chiang and Weisskopf. I think you know more about this kind of thing than we do, said Gus. We'll follow your lead, said Doug. So the assembled brass adopted various expressions of calm attention or confident smiles while the little blue-nosed boats approached. There were five of them, and Sanders thought their crews had reason enough to be intimidated before they saw the creatures waiting to greet them. 
In general form, the Bethos was like a 19th century sailing ship, but made of modern materials, spiced with alchemy, and fitted with modern equipment, tended by gremlins. Her white holland sails made her look like a huge cloud or swan, huge because she and her sister the Afros were the only Grand Norman ships designed to transport horses and centaurs for the landfaring side of Grand Normandy's explorations. The folk of Varsus would recognize the gun ports. If they worried about the radar and radio antennae, let them. The lions and fleur-de-lis of Grand Norman heraldry would be unfamiliar, but brave and bright, and the figurehead was a gilded ichthyocentaur gazing into a spyglass, an image, in fact, of Bethos, son of Kronos. There were four men in each blue-nosed boat, uniformed in blue and gray, all mainstream humans to look at, of some Mediterranean stop, perhaps. Of every four, three carried heavy crossbows. Aren't five a lot of boats to inspect one ship? Fletcher asked Gus quietly, even one this big. Yeah, you're right. Of course, more boats means more crossbows. Turnabout's fair play, Coudre remarked, but all this snorting and pawing the ground and fluffing our fur only works when it keeps the peace. I don't suppose they often shoot, do they, Captain Weisskopf? Of course not, ma'am. Bad for business. The five boats came on in V formation. As they approached, a figure carefully stood up in the center foremost boat, solid, clean-shaven, and graying. He held a ledger book, not a crossbow, and looked not at all intimidated. That's Tusig, Gus told them. Retired guardsmen. A lot of the customs officers are. Fletcher saw a hint of scowl behind the man's bold demeanor and thought the fellow recognized their fluffing fur and resented it. Well, who could blame him? And an officer for a city that faced on chaos would be schooled in the strange. The fellow's expression conveyed the idea, now what? On the other hand, who could blame wanderers in a strange land for wanting to forestall bullying? Fletcher sighed quietly behind the calm expression he held. When they were close enough, Kudre called, Nin suileyad, my greetings, in Cinderin. No one in this zone knew English, French, or Chenelais, but the Bethos crew was just beginning to learn Var Varsic, and they had the elf tongue in common. She continued in it. I'm Captain Rachel Kudre, and this is the Grand Norman naval vessel Bethos. Are you the custom inspectors of Huspahan? Officer Tusig called back, Yes, you are in the waters of the free city of Huspan. Know that all incoming goods are subject to tariffs in proportions according to their type. Of course, Kudre replied, but we are not here to trade. If you, there are remaining dock fees and a water toll you have already incurred, Tusig interrupted. What then is your business? We came on behalf of the Rauerhof. She nodded to her left and right, indicating Doug and Gus, where they flanked her. Tusig glared at Doug. You are Chong? Doug clasped his hands behind his back, wrapped his tail around his shins, and answered coolly, I am Guardsman Chiang of Huspan, Captain Chiang of the Rauerhof. You are Tusig? A caravan from Gelohan brought word you had been wounded escorting another caravan to Gelohan one that left about four ten days ago. They said you had lost a hand. True, Doug said. He displayed his hands and said, it grew back. His right hand was clearly paler and more slender. It had, as yet, no nails and certainly no spurs or scales on the back. Tusig stared at this for a few seconds, then demanded, why have you brought a battleship to Huspan? Doug smiled, looking infuriatingly cat-like. Rather, the ship has brought me. They're only giving me a ride out of generosity. Fletcher decided it was time to speak. And we are not a battleship, Officer Tusig. Our purpose is exploration. As you must know, the Rauerhof are wanderers from very far away. We have simply come to offer them a passage home. Eyes lit in Tusig's otherwise impassive face. Doug smiled broadly. See? 
there's a bright side. Our popularity's kind of spotty, Gus admitted. Still better in Husban than it's been anywhere else. It was nearly a month before. Gus and Doug had been made free of the Bethos for meetings with the many captains and their aides. The Rauerhoth and their discoveries were a great find for an exploratory expedition. For Gus and Doug, the Bethos was likewise a great discovery. First, of course, it was passage home. But it was already a taste of home. Yes, the crew included creatures at least as fantastic as themselves, but these folk, arcane or not, spoke English to them and used familiar gadgets. As he spoke, Gus gazed fondly at a running light, an actual electric light, on the mast before him. He sat cross-legged on the poop deck next to Doug in conversation with Coudre, Fletcher, Dean, and Elaine. It was evening, and the light shone white. They didn't have twenty open slots in their city guard, Gus told, Doug told Fletcher and the other captains, but they hired us on as a group, a kind of labor pool. If things get loud in the bad parts of town or dockside, they're happy enough to hire us to come with the regular patrols. Usually it's enough to loom behind the human and smile. He demonstrated, showing the predatory teeth. Fletcher nodded. His lessons to his own students included deterrent looming. But that doesn't sound like a lot of work, he remarked. It isn't, Gus agreed. They set a night patrol of six of us on the city border. I guess that's worked real well. But being Husband, they're wondering if it's worth the money. We can't afford boarding houses, Doug said, so we've set up a camp in some scrub woods at the edge of town that doesn't belong to anybody. Or, he showed his magnificent teeth again in a sour smile, no one wants to chase us out. It's mostly farmland, Gus said, so there's not much hunting, so we have to buy food in town. I'm surprised no one's accused us of stealing chickens or whatever those things are. I'm surprised they didn't just attack or run us off, Doug replied. Five years ago, Gus, Doug, and 25 companions had been transformed and abducted by a ruthless fay to be soldier slaves in her military adventures. Two years ago, the fay had died in battle, leaving the Rauerhoth, the Lion Host, as the fay had dubbed them, homeless and shapeshifted in a world that they would have dismissed as fantasy before their capture. The twenty remaining soldiers had tramped and sailed and ridden their way through the chaos marches from one world fragment to another, looking for a better lot. For much of that time, they had lived off the various kinds of land. Sometimes they could hire on as guards for a ship or caravan, but they were never welcome where they arrived. A score of huge, unasked-for lion soldiers? No thank you. Huspahan had been a little different. A trading center and seaport bordering chaos, already with a multi-species population, it took in the Rauerhoth without real shock. Still, that was not the same as welcoming. Some rich merchants hire us as house guards sometimes, Gus said, and there's guarding caravan traffic. Overland is slower, but it's cheaper than paying all the port fees, and it makes smuggling easier. Of course, there's bandits, and he nodded at Doug. His friend had lost his right hand in a bandit attack. The tip of the stump was lengthening and complicating, but no hand was there yet. No bandits on the water? No pirates? asked Coudre. Nope, Gus answered. That's the value you get for all the port fees and stuff. It sounds to me, said Captain Coudre, like they're trying to find a use for you, but haven't succeeded yet. Doug nodded. That's about right. Of course, it's only been a few months. Would there be any contractual problems with the Rauerhoth shipping out of Husband? she asked. Doug shook his head. His smile was non-toothy and rueful. They don't have us on long contracts. They don't pay before service. They don't let us buy on tab. I don't know everyone's debits and credits, but the total won't be much. Maybe some grocery bills, gambling debts for the stupid. We can cover such things, Coudre said. Thank you. Again.
Gus nodded, but added, We'll have been gone a month and some. Hope nothing's come up. Tusig made few further difficulties about letting Bethos into port. The docks were crowded with the people of Huspan in their bright robes, saris, and tunics, curious about the foreign ship. Give him a show, Kudre commanded, and had the broad, heavy-duty gangplank set out. Doug and Gus came marching down it, and Fletcher and Sanders came thundering behind. In the world of Varsus, news moved no faster than riders or the occasional messenger bird, not without magic. But someone might have expended magic on news like the Bethos, and in any case, there had been a month for word to get from Gelhoan to Haspahan. These folk had heard there was a ship from across chaos, crewed with a mix of humans and oddities, but they hadn't seen. Seasoned explorers, Fletcher and Sanders, were used to people who had never seen, maybe never heard of, creatures like themselves. They stood still, smiled, tipped their hats, and listened for remarks or questions in Sindarin or any other known language. The first such utterance they heard was in English and not addressed to them. Doug, Gus, over here! The speaker was another cat man, the third they had ever seen. He had chocolate brown skin and was dressed in a gray and blue uniform like Tusig's. Gus and Doug waved him over. He waded through the humans and began in a staccato Indian accent, Doug, we heard you had been, then trailed off, staring at Fletcher and Sanders. Fletcher was familiar with the reaction. The fellow had first seen the centaurs screened by the crowd, had assumed they were men on horseback, and was only now getting a clear view. Doug produced a grin laced with ivory blades, took his fellow's elbow, and pulled him toward the group. Captain Fletcher, he said, may I present my comrade in arms, Rahul Batra. Rahul, this is Captain Philip Fletcher of the Grand Norman Dedicated Cavalry, and his aide-de-camp, Lieutenant Liam Sanders. Despite appearances, they are from Earth, Midgard, Enorath. They're going home soon, and they can take us with them. Batra blinked. His eyes were too dark to show the slit pupils and made Fletcher think of the eyes of a deer. He doubted the poor cat man had had time to take in everything Doug said, but he had taken the salient point. Home? he echoed. Yes. A look of almost agonized joy spread over Batra's face. Then came doubt and confusion, and he put a hand up to the whiskers that flared from his muzzle and his ears, just now swiveled forward at full attention, drooped back and down. There's a fix for that too, Doug promised. The joy came back, mixed with some caution. Gus had been watching with a more restrained smile. Now he asked, what's been happening? Batra glanced from one captain to the other. Fletcher could see him shifting mental gears. Not too much bad news, he answered. Dan tried to rent a room in a boarding house and got in a fight. Well, an argument. Well, a little fight with the landlord, but we smoothed it over. Ted ran up some gambling debts. The worst bit is Marco got in a bar fight. Some adventurous girl let him kiss her, maybe invited him. Haven't heard her side. Her brother was there with a friend, and the friend egged him on to put a stop to it, and off they went. Gus sighed. Injuries? Nothing much on Marco, but he clubbed the brother. Uh, with the friend. Uh, broken ribs, dislocated shoulder, comes up before the magistrate within two days. I think the girl will speak up for him. Fletcher cleared his throat. What will be the outcome if the magistrate finds against Marco? Briefly, Batra gave Fletcher another wondering look, then answered, some months in the conscript pool, I guess. He explained, Instead of a jail, they farm prisoners out as labor to whoever wants them for whatever they want. There are spells or tattlers, I'm not sure which, to make sure no one runs away. Would paying damages and a fine do instead? Yeah, but we're all broke, or nearly. Well, we may be able to help. Let's get back to camp, Gus urged. Captain Fletcher's got more big news to give. And... We'll hear about life at camp and how they take the big news next time.